Over the past two years, we've received a number of requests. Uh, we've asked for your feedback and we've gotten feedback. We're grateful for it. Some of that feedback has included a number of requests for an introduction to the conversation. People from various disciplines are sometimes intrigued, but also sometimes a bit stymied by the conversations that take place in adjacent disciplines. And so people have asked for an overview of the conversation that sort of may serve to orient us to the weekend together. So tonight, uh, we thought it might be helpful to begin with such an introductory overview, and Jeff and Joel talked me into doing it. So, so here's what we'll do tonight. First, begin with a look at traditional doctrines of original sin, and then move toward discussion of some of the interesting and exciting developments in contemporary consideration of what we could call the quest for the historical Adam. And then we'll have time for some questions and answers. Those will go pretty much until I start fielding some that are really difficult, and then we'll be done for the evening. <laughs> so first, original sin, then original sinners and then some questions. First, the traditional doctrines of original sin. The doctrine of original sin is deeply traditional. It's also widely misunderstood in contemporary theology. It is, in my view, disappointingly easy to find references to what some people refer to as the doctrine of original sin that simply misunderstand the doctrine or that conflate it with the particular expression of it. Now, sometimes these understandings or misunderstandings are tied to strictly, say, biological or even sexual accounts. Sometimes the fortune of the doctrine are tied directly, say, to Augustine's rendering of F. Ho in Romans 5. But a closer look is actually rather eye-opening. It turns out that the Catholic Christian tradition has room for various accounts of the doctrine, indeed, ample room. It also turns out that some of the articulations of the doctrine are actually quite sophisticated, and the defenses of it turn out to be quite rigorous and impressive. So what are these doctrines? Well, first, let's bracket the heterodox extremes. So neither Pelagianism, on the one hand, as it's been referred to, nor Manichaeism. So the broad and deep Christian tradition has consistently and forcefully rejected various positions as being antithetical with biblical teaching. We'll start there, the easy ones. The church has consistently resisted what's commonly termed Pelagianism. And to immediately head off some unfortunate and persistent misunderstandings, the debate, at least the fourth and fifth century debates over Pelagianism were not about determinism versus indeterminism, or the possibility of Christian perfection, or the irresistibility of grace, or predestination, or the extent of the atonement, Avoiding such anachronistic misunderstandings, we see that the Pelagians rejected any notion that we're guilty for Adam's sin, and then went further in denying that Adam's sin had any residual or debilitating impact on the rest of us. As Gerald Bonner summarizes what he calls the fundamental difference between the Pelagian and their Augustinian opponents, it is this. As he says, for the Pelagians, human nature remained fundamentally sound, while for Augustine, it had been corrupted to a degree which made us helpless. While we're at it, the label semi-Pelagianism is unfortunate. It's unfortunate for several reasons. One of those is it comes into usage in the 16th century, and then only as a work of, as a, as a term of abuse. But it also signals something important and signals something similar. Even though for what we call semi-Pelagianism, even though we are all negatively impacted by sin, still it may be possible, at least for some of us, the better ones of us, to initiate the work of salvation apart from grace, at least where grace is understood as any kind of special pressure. Notably, both Pelagianism and the semi-position are decisively rejected in a series of synodical and conciliar statements that anathematize views such as these. Those that deny that the whole person, body and soul, were changed for worse by Adam's fall. Those that teach that human mortality was natural or normal apart from sin. Those that deny that the doctrine of original sin uh, is, is anything at all. 
and those who claim that we can somehow save ourselves or even initiate the process of salvation, as well as things like this. Senator Orange in 529 also anathematizes the view that God predestines anyone to evil, as well as those who would hold that the first step of faith can be found in human ability rather than divine grace. The resolute orthodox insistence is that without God's grace, God's prevenient, cooperative, and perfecting grace, there would be no hope of salvation. But while the church has insisted that we reject all forms of Pelagianism, it's done so while also insisting that we re reject every version of Manichaeism or other versions of Gnosticism. And at stake here is belief in the goodness of creation and to press even further the goodness of the creator. Accordingly, Christian theology, and this goes from the fourth and fifth century debates, well, and even before, all the way through the Protestant reformations, Christian theology consistently resists any notion that matter is intrinsically evil or that humans are evil by nature. That is to say, the doctrine of original sin is not the view that sin is original. It is most emphatically not the doctrine that humans are essentially evil. To the contrary, sin is consistently understood as being contrary to nature, as well as contrary to reason, and ultimately and always is contrary to God. All right, let's bracket those. In rejecting such views as extreme and mistaken, the church has never settled on one account of original sin as the orthodox position. Instead, several views have developed. One of the most famous, or for some infamous, is the family of views that travels under the name realism. As realists see things, there is a sense in which we are one, that is, really one, not just one in a legal sense, but really one with Adam. As Oliver Crisp puts it, the realist conviction is that in some way, in some way, Adam's progeny were really present with Adam at the point of his first sin. As Augustine famously puts it, we were all in that one man, since we all were that one man who fell into sin. For not yet was the particular form created and distributed to us in which we as individuals were to live, but already the seminal nature was there which, uh, from which we were to be propagated. And this, by, this being vitiated by sin and bound by the chain of death and justly condemned, man could not be born in any other state. Thus Augustine claims that since all were that one man, they individually derived original sin. Another famous modern proponent, Jonathan Edwards, says that God, in every step of his proceeding with Adam, in relation to the covenant or constitution established with him, looked on his posterity as being one with him. And though he dealt more immediately with Adam, yet it was as the head of the whole body and the root of the whole tree, and in his proceedings with them, he dealt with all the branches, as if they had been existing in their root. Thus, both guilt and also depravity of heart came upon Adam's posterity just as they came upon him, as much as if he and they had all coexisted like a tree with many branches. Now, there's some bold claims here. They call for some explanation, and Edwards gives it. One of the things he says is this. He says, some things which are entirely distinct and very diverse, yet are so united by the established law of the Creator, that by virtue of that establishment, they are, in a sense, one. Thus, he says, a tree, grown great, and a hundred years old is one plant with the little sprout the little sprout that first came out of the ground from whence it grew and has been continued in co constant succession. He says, perhaps not even one atom remains the very same. Yet God, according to an established law of nature, has in constant succession communicated to it many of the same qualities and most important properties as if it were one. So the upshot is this. Apparently something or some things count as one, 
They count as one if and only if God reckons it so. And indeed, it's the divine reckoning that makes it so. For according to Edwards, all of this depends in a radical sense on divine sovereignty. For there is no identity or oneness, he says, that does not depend upon the arbitrary constitution of the creator. Now, to say that the realist option is controversial is a fairly drastic understatement. But beyond the quick and easy dismissals, say, of Augustine's handling of F. Ho, or what we know now as Augustine's mistaken biology, there are serious criticisms, but there are also equally serious defenses of realism. Now, Edwards in particular is speculative, and I think, in my view, extravagantly so. And his own determinist, Lockean, and occasionalist version of the doctrine has come under heavy fire both then and now. But the Edwardian account is not the only possible version of realism. And recent work, and I, by recent I mean within the last couple of decades, recent work shows that with the right moves in four-dimensionalist metaphysics, it may be possible to yet salvage a realist account as consistent with moral responsibility. In other words, if we go with a, some version of four-dimensionalist metaphysics, and perhaps in particular with a worm theoretic account, or perhaps with a version of fission theory, realism may yet hold promise. Accordingly, even if there is no exegetical proof of realism, that is, Augustine's reading of Romans 5 doesn't qualify that way, yet it still may turn out that realism offers a way to maintain the key theological desiderata. Now, many contemporary evangelical Christians, and indeed many traditionally grounded Reformed Christians, are not realists, they're Federalists. They hold, that is, that Adam was our legal, our representative, or federal head. According to federalism, we're condemned because Adam stood in for us as the representative for the rest of us. Due to his relationship with us as our federal head or legally appointed representative, his guilt now counts as our guilt. As the reformed scholastic Francis Turretin says, the relationship between Adam and the rest of us includes a dimension that is, in his words, political and forensic, as he was the prince and representative head of the whole human race. This is often taken to be the reformed view, and for good reason. But while we're assigning sides, caution, I think, is in order here, and several caveats are important. One is this. We should remember that many Reformed theologians don't go in this direction. The Reformed theological tradition also has mediate theorist and realist, and even those who take what I refer to as a corruption-only view. And second, some very important theologians of the Wesleyan and Methodist traditions are also Federalist. John Wesley, for instance, defends the Westminster Confession of Faith line by line on this point. So the Federalist view is popular in some circles. We should also note that it continues to face stiff challenges. Some of these challenges concern the biblical basis of the proposal. Is it really so plain, the critics want to know? Is it really so plain from scripture that the covenantal arrangement is such that we are all individually guilty for the sin of our most ancient representative? Moreover, is it even possible to reconcile the Federalist proposal with moral responsibility? Does not scripture make it plain that the guilt of one person is not transferred to another as in Deuteronomy 24 or Jeremiah 31? Doesn't scripture make it plain that the son shall not bear the guilt of the father as in Ezekiel 18? Beyond federalism and realism, there are other options. Some theologians are convinced that we are both corrupted by original sin and guilty for it but they are also convinced that the sin for which we're guilty is not exactly the sin of Adam. According to these views, which are sometimes called mediate, we're guilty for the condition and state of the corruption. This approach also has many distinguished defenders within the Christian tradition and is finding some again today. Those defenders would include people such as Anselm, and at least on some readings, John Calvin. As Anselm expresses it, he says it can be said without contradiction that original sin is the same in everyone 
and that the Son will not bear the iniquity of the Father, and that God visits the sins of parents on the children unto the third and fourth generations. How does this work? Well, in his doctrine of original sin, we are guilty for original sin as well as corrupted by it, but we're not properly understood guilty for what Adam did. Instead, we're guilty on account of the sin itself. Thus, as Anselm says, when an infant is condemned for original sin, and note that for him infants are, the infant is not condemned for the sin of Adam, but for his own. Mediate accounts are a decidedly non-majority view, or report, at least in my view, but they should and do retain a place in the conversation. Recently, it's been noted that the theory is strengthened when allied with Molinist accounts of divine knowledge and providence. One other major traditional option is the affirmation of original sin that affirms the corruption of original sin without a corresponding affirmation of guilt. I take it safe to say that this is the consensus of early Christian theology, and by early I mean pre-Augustinian, both Latin and Greek. J.N.D. Kelly, for instance, says that although Athanasius saw a strong connection between Adam and all humanity, and indeed held that sin has passed to all men, he says that we never, never hints that we participate in Adam's original guilt. Greek patristic theology generally held this view as well. In Kelly's word, there's not a hint in the Greek fathers that mankind as a whole shares in Adam's guilt. Among pre-Augustinian Latin theologians, he takes as representative Ambrose's view that sin is a corrupting force that's transmitted to all, but the guilt for Adam's sin attaches to Adam himself, not to us. This is often understood to be the view of the contemporary Orthodox Church. Callistus Ware notes that most Orthodox theologians reject the idea of original guilt. Humans, Orthodox usually teach, automatically inherit Adam's corruption and mortality, but not his guilt. They're only guilty insofar as they, by their own free choice, imitate Adam. This is the view of, the Orthodox, of Orthodox Christians, but it's present in Protestantism as well. Within the Reformed tradition itself is defended by the important reformer Ulrich Zwingli. Zwingli is not alone or even lonely. Theologians as diverse as Jacobus Arminius, John Miley, more recently Stan Grenz, Richard Swinburne, and Oliver Crisp defend such accounts. The position, I think, should not be misunderstood. Proponents of the corruption-only views insist that we are, of course, guilty for sin. But we're guilty for the sins that we commit. We're not guilty for something our most ancient ancestors did. We obtain a kind of hereditary corruption from them, not unlike purely physical defects, which are heritable and indeed inherited. And we are guilty for sin as a matter of fact. But the sin for which we are guilty is our sin. We're guilty for the sins we commit, the bad stuff we do. Adam is guilty for his, and while we suffer the effects of Adam's sin, it is our own sin for which we are guilty. And I think at this point it's probably important again to point out that this should not be confused with Pelagianism or semi-Pelagianism. Now perhaps it could give safe harbor to a kind of semi-Pelagianism, but a theologian who holds a corruptional view can also hold this and fully embrace what, say, the formula of Concord says about corruption. When it says, in spiritual and divine things, the intellect, heart, and will of the unregenerate are utterly unable by their own natural powers to understand, believe, accept, think, will, effect, do, work, or concur in working anything, but they are entirely dead to what is good, and they are corrupt able only to do what is displeasing and contrary to God. Someone who holds a corruption only view can hold such a view as this. And surely this is a far cry from Pelagianism. Moreover, it should be obvious that there is nothing about this view that commits it to semi-Pelagianism as such. For we're going to hold the corruption only view and with consistency maintain the admission of complete inability and even if they desire the phrase total depravity. 
All right, these are, that's a quick overview um, of views of uh, the doctrine of original sin. Turning our attention to contemporary discussions of the original sinners, we see that while convictions about the fact of original sin are widely held and deeply rooted within the tradition of Christian theology, when it comes to consideration of higher resolution details, there is a lack of consensus. But it's something of an understatement to say there is solidarity on the basic points. But if it's something of an understatement to say that such convictions about the doctrine of original sin are widely held and deeply rooted within and across the various ecclesial traditions of Christian theology, it's also something of an understatement to say that such convictions are widely criticized and dismissed as being inconsistent with the assured results of modern science. Thus recently, the theologian Aaron Riches expresses the worry. He says, the best scientific evidence would seem to contradict outright the traditional teaching of the church. The famous priest and physicist John Polkinghorne observes that the doctrine of the fall is what he calls the major Christian doctrine that I find most difficult to reconcile with scientific thought. The noted philosopher of science, Michael Roos, says this of the traditional Christian account. He says, according to modern science, there was no unique Adam and Eve. The Augustinian solution fails in the face of modern science. It just doesn't work. Similarly, the theologian and biologist, Dennis Lamoureux, says that his central conviction is this. Adam never existed, and this fact has no impact whatsoever on the foundational beliefs of Christianity. More recently, the physicist Carl Giberson leaves no room for doubt. Adam and Eve, he says, as described in Genesis, cannot have been historical figures. Recent work in genetics has established this unsettling conclusion beyond any reasonable doubt. Now, I take it that such, such challenges should be taken seriously. So do you. That's why we're here. But here's what we seem to know. Here's where we're at. That evolutionary history shows a great deal of predation, death, and extinction throughout the process. That morphological evidence as well as genomic sequence data show that humans and other primates share a common ancestry. And that the initial human population would have had to evolve as a group and would have had to have been several thousand in number. The first of these we can loosely call the red tooth thesis. It affirms death before a fall. The second we can term the common ancestry thesis. Mammals have been around for about 65 million years and primates for around 50 million years. Various forms of non-human hominins begin to appear with Homo habilis emerging about one and a half million years ago, Homo erectus about a million years ago, Homo sapiens about a half million years ago. Various species of Homo genus have developed, among them Neanderthals, modern humans, as well as hobbits, Denisovans, and others. My kids love it when I mention the hobbits. Really? Yeah. Morphological evidence has been taken to suggest um, or demonstrate common ancestry for some time. But with the rise of genetic science, and particularly the work of the Human Genome Project and the work downstream of that, the case for common ancestry is now considered conclusive. The evidence is in, and the analysis of DNA shows that we share our remote ancestors in common with other hominins, some of whom are now extinct, and indeed other primates, both those extinct and those still evolving and surviving. We refer to the third as the large initial population thesis. The same genetic evidence that shows common ancestry also reveals that the initial population of humans must have evolved as a large group. As Dennis Venema and Scott McKnight explain, put most simply, the evidence indicates that humans descend from a large population because we, as a species, are so genetically diverse in the present day that a large ancestral population is needed to transmit that diversity to us. They conclude that, quote, every genetic analysis estimating ancestral population sizes has agreed that we descend from a population of thousands, not a single ancestral couple. In light of this, where are we at in Christian theology? And it seems to me that we're faced with several possibilities. And I'll offer a brief overview of, the, of some of those. I draw attention to some of these here, but I also think it's important to note that there are others which I don't mention and of which we won't discuss. 
some of which are fascinating indeed, such as HUD Hudson's hypertime atom. First, what I will loosely refer to as refurbishment proposals. The first is a cluster of proposals I'll lump together and refer to generally as refurbishment proposals. One way to maintain or attempt to maintain consistency is to accept the standard evolutionary account but then suggest that God took two existing hominids and refurbished them. On this proposal, one accepts, or at least can accept, the, the orthodox evolutionary account. One need not quibble, that is, with standard claims about, say, the age of the universe, the development of life on this planet, the emergence of mammals and other primates, their development into homo sapiens and into modern humans. On this account, pre-human hominins develop physically, mentally, and perhaps to some degree spiritually in the long and bloody process that seems to be basic to the evolutionary model. And then, at the right moment, that is, if not in the fullness of time, then at least close to it, God acts to radically change the state, status, and future of a certain species. As the 19th century Methodist theologian William Burt Pope puts it, created out of the dust, he, that is Adam, is a development of older physical types, a final development on which evolution has spent itself, found worthy at last to be the receptacle of an immortal spirit. So in this account, God reworks, rehabilitates, refurbishes a pair of these existing creatures. God elects them, if you will, for relationship and service. These humans and their progeny are gifted with the divine image and the mental, relational, spiritual gifts and responsibilities that come with that image. There are different versions of this. Here's a representative statement from Peter Van Inwagen. He says, for millions of years on this account, perhaps for thousands of millions of years, God guided the course of evolution so as eventually to produce certain very clever primates, the immediate predecessors of Homo sapiens. At some time, he says, there was a, at some time, there was a point at which every ancestor of modern human beings who was then alive was a member of a particular group of primates. In the fullness of time, he says, God took the members of this breeding group and miraculously raised them to rationality. That is, he gave them the gifts of language, abstract thought, disinterested love, and of course, the gift of free will. He says, we cannot understand all his reasons for giving human beings free will, but here's one important one we can understand. He gave them the gift of free will because free will is necessary for love. He says God not only raised these primates to rationality, not only made of them what we call human beings, but also took them into a kind of mystical union with himself, the sort of union Christians hope for in heaven and call the beatific vision. Being in union with God, these new human beings these primates who would become human beings at a certain point in their lives, lived together in the harmony of perfect love and also possessed what theologians used to call preternatural powers. Because they lived in the harmony of perfect love, none of them did harm to others. Because of the preternatural powers, they were able somehow to protect themselves from wild beasts, from disease, and from random destructive natural events like earthquakes and all. There was no evil in the world. And it was God's intention that they should never become decrepit with age or die, as their primate forebearers had done. But they abused the gift of free will and separated themselves from their union with God. And from there we know the rest of the story. The fall brought sin and suffering, death and destruction. And that's one, one version of this approach. Different suggestions fit under this umbrella. The one offered by Van Inwagen is only one option. Various biblical scholars and theologians have suggested some version or other of this proposal. And indeed, there are different views on the market. Dennis Alexander, John Stott, C.S. Lewis, Jamie Smith, Tom Wright, and others have suggested something along these lines. There are different versions, of course. Some people take this refurbishment to have happened a very long time ago. Others take it to be more recent, even Neolithic. Some versions of this proposal would include the bestowal of a soul. Others, such as Van Wagens, wouldn't. One variation might hold that God so refurbished more than 
more than the initial couple. On this twist, Adam and Eve may be the top two, perhaps the chieftains, but not the only two. You can see how this would intersect with what we referred to earlier as Federalist accounts of the doctrine of original sin. This variant would, of course, have the advantage of helping to explain how the children of the first couple found sexual mates and spouses without resorting, on the one hand, either to incest or, on the other, to bestiality. Josh Swamidas offers a similar account. It's one that allows for, it's different in the sense that it allows for a genuinely de novo creation of Adam and then of Eve directly from Adam. It will, it will require, at least in my view, a more philosophically precise and theologically informed account of what it means to be human than seems to be available on standard issue, strictly biological accounts. But that in itself may be judged a good thing for theologians and other Christians. Now, I'm confident we'll hear a great deal more about this this week, so I'll pass over this now for the sake of time. Even from this brief sketch, where does this leave us? Recall the earlier claims, those by people like Michael Roos and those by people like Carl Geiberson. Recall the earlier claims that science contradicts Christian belief. The claims were that, that it is not so much as possible that both the science and the doctrine of original sin and original sinners is true. Is that right? Now we have a lot of work before us, even this weekend. But I think we're already in a position to see that that isn't right. Note the strength of the claims made by Ruth, Skyberson, and Enns. They're not merely observing that there is some metal element of mystery here. They're not simply admitting that there's a lot that we don't know. Nor are they pointing to some areas of tension or possible conflict. No, their confident assertions seem much stronger to me. They're claiming that it's impossible to believe both the deliverances of modern science and classical Christian doctrine. They cannot be reconciled. That is, it's not so much as possible that both are simultaneously true. Accordingly, I take it, these beliefs would either be contrary or contradictory. Now, if some proposition P is contra contradictory to some proposition Q, then it's possible that either P or Q is true, but not possible for both P and Q to be true. And it's not possible that both P and Q are false. That is, if P and Q are contradictory, they are mutually exhaustive as well as mutually inconsistent. If some proposition P is contrary to some proposition Q, then it's not possible that both P and Q are true. They're mutually exclusive, but not mutually exhaustive. The upshot is this. If it's so much as possible that both P and Q are true, then they're neither contradictory nor contrary. That is, if it's possible that both are true, then affirmation of Q can't be taken to rule out P. And affirmation of P cannot be taken to eliminate the possibility of Q. Affirmation of some P shouldn't be taken as reason to reject Q. Affirmation of Q is not a good reason to reject belief in P. Now, perhaps surprisingly, I think, at least considering, surprising considering how common and how vehement are the assertions to the contrary, it turns out there's good reason to doubt the claim that the contemporary scientific consensus is inconsistent with the core of, the, of traditional Christian belief. In other words, neither contrariness nor contradictoriness follows from the conjunction of the scientific consensus and traditional Christian belief. For indeed, it is possible that both are true. Consider how Todd S. Beale summarizes what he, as a self-avowed young earth creationist, consider how he summarizes what he takes to be the crucial theological desiderata. The best interpretation, in his words, the best interpretation of the biblical witness is that Adam and Eve are real historical persons created uniquely by God as the first human pair and the universal ancestors of the rest of humanity. Now, perhaps surprisingly, it turns out that it seems that there may be more than one way to meet these desiderata without rejecting contemporary genetic science and paleoanthropology. 
There's nothing, or at least nothing obviously, about the conjunction of the red tooth thesis, the common ancestry thesis, and the large initial population thesis that's inconsistent with Adam and Eve being real historical individuals. Nor is this inconsistent with the belief that Adam and Eve were created uniquely by God. Nor yet is it inconsistent with conviction that they are the universal ancestors of humankind. Nor further is it inconsistent with the view that human death is the result of human sin. There's more than one way to hold to both. Now suppose someone objects that possibilities are cheap and protests that this sounds like a bunch of what ifery. Well, fair enough. So let us go as far as we can. But let us do so without laboring under the assumption that it's not possible that the main lines of traditional Christian doctrine are true if mainstream science tells us the truth. Making this less abstract, I hope, um, let P stand for the conjunction of the theses drawn by mainstream science. And let Q stand for the desiderata laid out by Beale. Any lack of scientific support for, say, the refurbishment proposals, any lack of scientific support for the details of the refurbishment proposals themselves doesn't count against belief in either P or Q. Indeed, it seems we'd only be tempted to think that if we're either confused or laboring under the spell of scientism. Similarly, lack of, say, theological or exegetical support for, say, the details of a genealogical Adam proposal, lack of theological or exegetical support for the details of those claims, that doesn't count against either that proposal or against mainstream contemporary science. Lack of evidence for these proposals is just that, lack of evidence in their favor. Such lack of evidence counts as a salutary caution about being too enthusiastic or dogmatic in support of any of these proposals. But it does nothing to undercut grounds for belief in the deliverances of modern science or in traditional Christian doctrine. It might be helpful to recognize that something similar seems to happen when scientists find reason to hold to some proposition, say R, that seems to be supported by scientific evidence, and they also find reason to hold to some other proposition S that also seems to be supported by scientific evidence, but that seems to be of questionable consistency with R. Now, if we know that this R and S are mutually exclusive, say Einsteinian versus Heisenberg or Copenhagen interpretations of quantum theory, then we know it's not possible that both are true. But rather than assume this in every instance, I take it that we first try to sort things out. We look for possibilities, look for ways that both are true. For instance, consider what Daryl Falk does when con discussing the evolution of old world and new world monkeys. After noting the proliferation and diversity of new world monkeys, 124 species, he tells us, he compares them with old world monkeys, and he points out that the new world monkey, the old world monkeys tend to have narrower snouts, nostrils that face down rather than up, they don't have much in the way of tails, they are jealous of the long prehensile tails of their South American cousins. He notes that fossils found from about 35 million years ago show close relationships between these old world monkeys and the new world monkeys. And these fossils, this fossil record, leads us to the conclusion, he says, that they actually stem from the same ancestral species. This raises a question. How then did they get separated? Now, the easy answer for someone who doesn't know anything like this, like me, would be, oh, I can figure this one out. The continents used to fit together, right? On my globe, I can see how they came apart. That would be the easy answer. It would seem to be that the continents of Africa and South America were formerly contiguous, and that the separation of the continents, which had to do with tectonic plate shifts, that resulted in the changes that we now see in the various species of monkeys. But, alas, this explanation is too easy and won't work. Here's why it won't work. It won't work because the continental shift took place about 100 million years ago, and the strikingly close similarities in the fossil record are about 70 million years too recent for that. So, here's the question Falk faces. How did they get separated? 
How did these monkeys get from Africa to South America? Now, Falk tells us, he says, there is, quote, almost unanimous consensus that something close to the following happened. A small number, perhaps a single pregnant female, was trapped on a huge tropical tree as it floated down river, possibly in a massive flood. And then, having been transported in an ocean current, the tree with its clinging cargo made it to South America. We might call this the pregnant hitchhiking monkey thesis. <laughs> Note that Fogg presents no scientific evidence, morphological, genetic, or otherwise, for the pregnant hitchhiking monkey thesis. He gives us no evidence that this actually happened. I mean, we do have some old photographs. Um, <laughs> But don't get too excited about those because they don't actually show us everything we think. They, we show, they show us that she made it onto the raft. <laughs> but we don't know that the raft made it very far. In fact, we have evidence that shows it probably didn't work out too well. Um, I suspect that he fails to offer this evidence because there's no such evidence for the pregnant hitchhiking monkey thesis. Nor is it super easy. <laughs> yeah, like I said, it doesn't look good. Um, <laughs> We know she made it on, but we don't know that she made it there. Hard to see how that evidence is going to be available. Now, sans evidence, Falk's postulation also looks liable to the charge of what ifery. I don't mean this critic, I don't mean this as a criticism, just as an observation. To be clear, I'm not saying that his claim is in fact false. It surely seems possible. And it may indeed be the most plausible suggestion we have. It looks to me like a possible way of reconciling the beliefs, the belief that these monkeys share common ancestry with the belief that the, that the continent separated tens of millions of years before the changes happened. So far as I can see, it's no worse off for being the postulate of a possibility. But so far as I can see, that's all it is. Now, someone could wonder, why would Falk make these sort of moves? Why would he appeal to a mere possibility? Isn't this just speculative what if he tacked on to interesting scientific findings in order to maybe salvage his pet view? Well, probably not, or at least not obvious. More charitably, I think that these appeals to possibility most likely are made because scholars who make these sort of appeals feel evidential pressure from both sides. In other words, they feel like there's good reason to affirm this, and they feel there's good reason to affirm this as well, and they look for ways to put it together. In other words, they feel the strength of the arguments for both, and they think that it would be a mistake to let the evidence for one force them to abandon the other, unless, of course, it can be shown that the propositions are inconsistent. I don't fault them for this. I see no problem with appeals to possibility per se, at least so long as it's admitted that these are mere possibilities, rather than presented as if they're part and parcel of the science, or in our case, as if they're part and parcel of the exegesis and theology. The upshot is this. So far as I can see, if we have good reason, and I understand that is a conditional that we're here to discuss, but if we have good reason to think that science affirms what I've called the conjunction of these theses, right, on the one hand, and if we think that there are good theological reasons to continue to believe in the doctrine of original sin as committed by original sinners, then we do indeed have good reason to, to maintain belief in both. The lack of scientific evidence for the theological claims doesn't count as evidence against the scientific claim, or the theological claims. It only does if these are inconsistent. But until it can be shown that they're inconsistent, there's no reason to take the scientific claims to rule out the theological. Similarly, lack of theological support for the distinctive claims of the sciences doesn't, or at least I don't think shouldn't, count against belief in the science. Going further, lack of 
theological or scientific evidence for the distinctive elements of these possible proposals, right, these proposals of possibilities, doesn't, at least in my view, shouldn't count against them. It should slow us down. It should make us think, let's not get too excited about jumping on any particular bandwagon about ways to put this together. Because lack of evidence for them is just that. But it's not evidence against them. Nor is it evidence against any of the positions that are trying to be held together. All right, let me just say again, uh, we obviously have much work before us. I'm thrilled that you're here. Um, I think that we've had two wonderful years of the project so far. Um, I think that we've had two wonderful DeBar conferences so far. Uh, my hopes for this one are much higher because of your work. Uh, let me say thank you, welcome, and let's get to it. Thank you. Thank you.